All right, good evening, finally. We're back together again. Uh, last week was definitely a, a doozy for all of us. Um, but we are back. We're going to go ahead and pick up. I know we tried on Monday. We tried to end up having the class, technical issues and power and all that. So we had to postpone it. So we're uh, picking back up from where we were. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and cover this again uh, and make certain that everybody's on the same page so we're not leaving anybody out. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and start uh, with Unit 1, the Introduction to Modern Real Estate Practice. We're going to be talking about Principles 1. Um, so I guess my mouse is not working. There we go. Uh, so first thing we're going to be talking about is we're going to identify the various carrier, uh, careers that are available in real estate uh, and the professional organizations that support them. We're also going to describe the five uses of real property and list the seven sources of real estate law and also give an example of each one of them. Um, and we'll also describe the physical and economic characteristics of real estate as well as explaining the operations of supply and demand in the real estate market and identify the economic, political, and social factors that are going to influence uh, the supply and demand of the real estate cycle as well. Uh, so of course, like we talked before, I'm going to put them all up here real quick. Real estate has many different types of specializations. There are many, many different types. You have your real estate brokerage, uh, you have your real estate appraising, you have your property management, your apartment locating, financing, and property inspection. All of these end up, they play a big effect into the overall industry as a whole. Okay, So in this particular situation, you do end up having uh, your brokerage, which is kind of what I am, I'm a real estate broker, I sponsor agents. Uh, and so in that particular situation is you could start your own real estate brokerage after four years of being an agent. Uh, now understand that has to be consistent. You cannot break it up. It has to be consistent of four years. So you couldn't do, uh, you know, work one year, wait five years, work uh, three years. It, it has to be consistent, meaning that within the past five years, you had to have been active for four of the five. So if you've ended up, you've been licensed for two years, you take a four year break, well, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna lose one of those years, okay? So you gotta show a total of four years uh, that's gonna be within the five year consistently active. Uh, so a broker, basically my job is I sponsor agents like we've been talking, this is what you're most familiar with. Uh, the other one is real estate appraising, okay? Now, understand real estate appraising is a completely different model. So in this situation, it's a completely different ballpark. Okay, uh, Real estate appraising is going to end up, it's going to be different uh, because of the fact of the matter is, is that you're ending up, the appraiser is actually going to be the one that goes out and buy, or not values, but gives an opinion of value. Uh, but you have to get a completely different license. Uh, you do have to end up working for an appraiser and things to that nature, just like an agent. Uh, there's also property management. Uh, you actually, as a real estate agent, uh, if your broker allows it, you could also manage properties. Uh, you can either manage properties under that broker, or you can manage properties if you worked for an apartment complex. Um, another one is apartment locating. You can do that with your license, with the license you get. You can become a, uh, an apartment locator. It's basically, you help people find rent or leases. Uh, that basically falls under that one. Uh, you can also be a mortgage broker. A mortgage broker is an individual that goes out and helps people get financing and lending, uh, get mortgages, get money, okay? Uh, and then the last one, of course, is property inspection. And property inspection is a very big one too. Because property inspection comes into a situation where what ends up happening is uh, they go around, they look at the property, they tell you what's wrong with the property, uh, and give you a review of what they think is wrong with it. But again, all of these fall under the entire business specialization of real estate. Now, 
you also can go into what's called property development. And property development in this situation is you actually, a person has raw land. Uh, say, for example, that Mr. Grossman here, he has some raw land. Uh, it's got 25 acres. He wants to develop it. He wants to put homes on it, subdivision. Uh, that is an option as well. Do you need a real estate license to do property development? No, you don't need that, okay? However, it's beneficial to have it so that once you do develop it, you can sell the lots off. Um, counseling. <laughs> Everybody always thinks, what in the world does counseling have to do up here? Well, Mr. Travis, when you uh, deal with clients, you got to do any counseling? Yeah, most of the time. Most of the time? How about you, Mr. Snep? You, you ever got to counsel your clients? Uh, Sometimes a lot, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, both Mr. Travis and Mr. Grossman can tell you is in real estate, it's a lot of counseling. Okay. It's a lot of different counseling. It's a lot of different situations. Uh, you, you're dealing with things that are very um, emotional for a lot of people. Now, we don't call ourselves counselors, but we are basically, we help those individuals uh, through the difficulties of real estate. Okay. So sometimes you may end up, I know Mr. Grossman currently has one, uh, one client that is very stressed out right now. Uh, the individual needs a house very badly. And so Mr. Grossman is constantly having to reassure the client. It's going to be fine. We'll find you something. So that reassurance basically helps in the counseling aspect of it. Now, I'm not saying that you got to go get a, a licensed professional counselor's license to do this. I'm just saying you got to be there to help them, okay? Um, of course, education, you can do what I'm doing right now. Uh, you can end up, you can become an educator. The uh, reason why Mr. Travis and Mr. Grossman's here is you can become an educator, you can teach, uh, and you can assist people in getting their licenses. Um, you can do title and abstracting. Uh, title and abstract work, I actually, like I think I've told you before, I teach that class as well on the side. Uh, but you can become a title and abstractor. You can go out, you can actually help find the records, look at it. If your client, say for example, Travis, is wanting to know, is there any liens on the property? You become a title abstractor, you can go out there and find that information for them. Now, do I recommend an agent do the title abstract work on their own sale? No, it's conflict of interest, okay? However, it is beneficial, say Travis wants to start buying properties and not have to pay title, he may want to know that information, or Mr. Grossman may want to know that, so they can do their own work and not have to pay hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in abstracting and title work. Um, urban planning. Now that kind of goes back up here to the property development, uh, but if you're in a city, uh, urban planning is very big as well. Uh, it's more of a job. You're working for the cities uh, in regards to where we're going to develop, how we're going to develop an area. You can also do timeshare sales, okay? I actually looked into this one time. Um, it's, it can be good, it can be bad, it just depends. Timeshares have just kind of gotten a bad rap over the years. Timeshares can be beneficial and they can be detrimental. It just it depends on what you're gonna use them with. Uh, but you can have timeshare sales as well. And the last one, which one of my good friends does this, is Petroleum Landman. Um, a petroleum landman is basically uh, you work for the oil and gas company. So say, for example, uh, Mr. Grossman here, he wants to go out into the property or into an area. Uh, say they tell you Navasota, Mr. Grossman. We want you to go to every residence within this 50 mile radius and we want you to knock on their doors because we're going to want to do some drilling and we want to be able to go and do services on those properties. We'll pay them for letting us drill, but we want you to go from door to door and end up having them sign a form that they can drill, okay? So that's additional monies that you can do. The thing I will tell you, my buddy used to have it, he had a binder that thick, no joke, y'all. That sucker was huge. And he had to end up, every one of the people that was in that binder, he had to have them sign, okay? Uh, but it's good money, it's good money on the side. Um, types of real estate, <clears throat> well, we all know the most important one, and that's basically residential. Everybody knows what residential is. Uh, so the initial one is residential. That's what I would say 80 to 85% of most people do. Um, actually, I'll tell you, probably 80 85% do residential. Uh, let's see, on commercial, 
I'd say maybe 10% commercial. Uh, and then industrial, maybe 5%. Okay. And mixed use, maybe 1% or 2%. Uh, and then agricultural, about that 1% or 2% as well. Uh, and special purpose, same in there. But the one that they're missing up here that's the biggest one, what do you think, Cuz? You remember what it is? It starts with an L. Land. No, not land. That'd fall under agricultural. Leasing. Oh, yeah. Leasing. Leasing actually throws to be one of the bigger ones. Okay. Uh, leasing is residential. What they're trying to probably encompass everything is, is leasing as residential. But I always put leasing separate because when you see residential, you think sales. You don't always think renting uh, an apartment. Okay. So Breaking this down, majority share is going to be residential. Leasing would be next. Commercial would be after that. And then the remainder of these would be just very small parts of the pie. Okay. So if I had a pie chart up here, uh, residential would be the most, commercial would be the second most, or leasing would be the second most, commercial would be third, and then the remainders would just have very small little chunks of it left. So with that being said, Let's now talk about the different sources of the law. Okay. Well, the United States Constitution is the law of the land. Okay. So we're going to go into a little bit of legal part here. This is my part that I like to, to definitely teach on here. Uh, so the Constitution basically is the, the end all of everything. Okay. Uh, if there is something that is not going to end up being in compliance with the United States Constitution, then it is unconstitutional and thus it means what, Travis? It's illegal. It's illegal. It's not good. Okay? You cannot utilize it. Okay? So anything that it goes against the Constitution, we don't care. Okay? So if Travis, if you were to go over and uh, you wanted to discriminate against females, is that part of the United States Constitution? Can you discriminate against females? No. no, because under all these other laws, we have rules that says that that's not constitutional. Okay. Uh, so in the situation is, I always like when I was in taking my law classes, I always like them to flip it. Most of my professors when I was in school, they would always start off with like local ordinances and state laws and then work their way up. And the reason they did that was they always would show the least to the highest. With us in this source, we're talking about the most powerful of all. Everything underneath the United States Constitution has to be in line with this one. So if, for example, a federal law is put into play that goes against the United States Constitution, it no longer can be law. Okay, It's unconstitutional. Same thing goes with a local ordinance. If a local ordinance says that nobody can end up, you cannot have, um, you cannot no longer, Travis, say that uh, Bryan College Station created an ordinance that says, uh, Travis, you can no longer sell to females. Never again. Can't sell to them. Well, what's the problem here? Number one, you lost a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. Number two is, let's look back up here. Do you think any of these above that is going to trump that ordinance? in a heartbeat, okay, especially the state law. So when we go into these situations, you have to know these different laws that go into play. Now, why exactly are court decisions though, why are they so far at the bottom? What do you think court decisions would be up here by the constitution? Let's think about this, okay? Honestly and truthfully, court decisions truthfully could go underneath underneath the state constitution and the United States Constitution. Okay? Because oftentimes you don't just have an issue. It's like, think of it this way, Travis. So I'm sitting here and you're sitting there. I'm minding my own business. You're minding your own business. Does just a miracle, like an argument, just pop up a miracle like that? Boom! There's a miracle. There's a Sometimes. there's an argument. Is that how it works? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> the thing is, is that they don't normally Normally, the reason we have court intervention is because there's some ordinance or some problem, okay? So what happens is, is these are your different sources of the law, but you have to understand that the biggest ones, if I was to break this down, the top three, 
deals at the federal level. Okay. The bottom four are all at the state level. So let me ask you, Mr. Grossman, I've picked on Travis a little bit. I'm going to pick on you for a bit. Is every single state constitution the same in the entire United States? No. Why not? Why do you say no? They want to all adopt their own policies. They all want their own rules. Okay. So in that situation is, is if you take Texas and you go to Florida, you're going to have two completely separate policies, two separately, completely different things. So in this situation is you have to understand that you're going to have these different ordinances, you're going to have different laws, and you're going to have different types of constitutions. Everything's going to be different. Just like in the same town, we're in Bryan College Station. Bryan has different rules than College Station. Okay. So you have to understand in these situations, these different laws and how they basically affect. And why do we spend time on this in real estate? You're all like, I'm not going to be a lawyer. I don't need this stuff. Yeah, you do. Because the fact is, we're dealing with it right now. College Station wants to restrict how many unrelated people can be in your home. Okay. While Brian doesn't care. Okay. The problem with this is that does that not cause issue that local ordinance does that not cause issue if mr travis you're an investor a, a, lot, a lot of issues because now if you can only have two unrelated people and you have a four bedroom house how many people can you now rent to two how much money did you lose half your money you happy no no okay so as a real estate agent sometimes we have to actually advocate and we have to go to that not for just ourselves but for our client okay and that's one thing about me being on the board is that i have to do that sometimes i had to advocate on behalf of my clients next uh, now the federal laws that affect real estate now the biggest one that most people are, are worried about of course as always is the tax law and mr grossman why do you think tax law is such a big deal What's it affect? Everyone. Well, what, what does it take from you? Uh, What's taxes do? It takes your money. It takes that money. How many of y'all want to just give your money up? Nobody. Okay. So capital gains tax law is always going to be that one at the federal law level. It tells you exactly what's taxable and what is not taxable. Also at the federal level, we deal with fair housing. Everybody has a right to live in their property, not based off of their sex, their religion, their creed, or anything to that nature. They have a right to live in a property without being judged by their looks, the way they act, who they worship. They should not in that situation be judged, okay? Equal credit law. We have to make certain that, say for example, that, let's see here, Mr. Keith, we gotta make certain that Mr. Keith and Mr. Travis, y'all on the same page. It's not fair, Mr. Travis, if Mr. Keith gets more money because you know he ends up he's got to buy a better job and you got a crappy job they shouldn't just deny you it needs to be fair now of course if he makes more money than you he's going to get more but we should not simply just say well you work at a poor place so we're not going to give you no money everybody has to have equal credit opportunity okay we also deal with the real estate settlement law what we're talking on settlement we're not talking about a lawsuit okay we're talking about once it's all said and done, once we go to closing, the settlement procedures. How exactly are we going to settle all of the monies? Okay. Now, what are some state laws that affect real estate? Well, contract law. That's what we deal with. If you were with me on day one, that's what we started off with was contracts. Because contract law does what? It's the binding agreement between the parties. General property law. We need to also have certain laws in regards to what you can and cannot do with your property. Again, like I said before, we don't want Mr. Travis moving next to Mr. Stephan and opening a pig farm. Okay. And I don't think Mr. Travis wants me moving next door to him and having a chicken coop. Okay. We, we got some problems here, right? We're, we're turning into an agricultural place here, right? So you got to make certain that you have certain rules in play. Also, the biggest one for a lot of you that are listening to me is landlord tenant. You want to make certain as a tenant that your rights are being respected. I had a, to give you an example, 
uh, this past week with all the craziness that's been going on. Uh, I had a uh, I had a tenant, and, well, which is also one of my old students. He ended up. He called me and he said um, he said uh, Justin. He said I got a problem. He says I'm renting from this one company, and we've been out of heat since Sunday of last week. And they said that they won't be able to get somebody out until after all this bad weather's gone. Well, what's the problem with that, Mr. Travis? No heat and single digit temperatures. How's that go for y'all? It was bad, man. It's bad, right? I dealt with that one day. Yeah. So in that situation is you need to know as a tenant, what is my rights as a tenant? And as a landlord, what do I have to do? Okay. You need to be able to know those differences. Because I will tell you, and Mr. Travis might can agree and Mr. Grossman, there are some what we call slum landlords, okay? And what I mean by slum landlords, I've rented from one before, okay? And the thing is, is they don't fix nothing. They don't fix nothing. Or if they do, they go over there and they just basically barely fix it enough just to operate at the bare minimum, okay? You don't want that, all right? We also have agency law, which is what we've also spoke about in the previous class, law of agencies. Basically about your, you representing another individual. Of course, we have our real estate license law. That's basic common sense there. And then your consumer protection. Like I told you, the real estate test is focused more about the realtor than the consumer, right? No. no. I tricked you there for a minute. No, it's about the consumer, not the realtor. We don't care about you as a realtor because you're the, you're the expert. Yeah, you know you That's right. You should know better. All right. It's kind of like I tell people in this situation. It's like a parent and a child. If the child goes and steals something, is the child, are they going to be the one that's going to be punished or is, should it be the parent? It should be the parent. Why? Because the parent should have taught their child better. Same thing as a real estate professional. It is my job to take care of my client, but also know better, okay? There are also professional associations. The biggest and most important one that you'll know about, and you'll hear a million times as a real estate agent, is the National Association of Realtors. Biggest one, okay? And by the way, you have to join to be called a realtor. Just because you get a license and you pass my classes and you go and get your real estate license, uh, you are not a realtor. You are a real estate agent. Okay, so you cannot call yourself a realtor right after you pass your real estate exam. You are only a real estate agent. I cannot tell you how many times that people will post on Facebook and they say, "Yay, I just passed my exam and I'm a realtor," and I'm like, "No, honey, you're not. <laughs> you know, you are uh, a real estate agent. You want to be used the word realtor? You have to join NAR." Okay. They also have other professional designations. Uh, you can get your GRI. Uh, you always encourage my agents to get their GRI just because of the, the knowledge and the, and the information that's provided is extremely beneficial. Uh, but the professional designations they do provide. Uh, there is also underneath the National Association is what we call the Texas Association of Realtors. Now, they no longer, they recently have changed their name. It's no longer Texas Association of Realtors. It is now Texas Realtors. Uh, they did not like being called TAR. Uh, NAR is called NAR, and so everybody would just call us TAR. And so they didn't like that, so they are now TR. So we are Texas Realtors. We're not Texas Association of Realtors. Um, and then, of course, You'll have your local association of realtors. Uh, if you're in Houston, that's TAR, Houston Association of Realtors. If you're in Austin, you're going to be the Austin Board of Realtors, uh, which is called ABOR. If you're going to be in this area, Bryan College Station, you're the BCS Regional Association of Realtors. Okay, uh, But all of these associations create further detail in regards to uh, compliance, making certain realtors meet a certain standard. And then lastly, there is the National Associations of Real Estate Brokers. Now, this association is not as large or well known as NAR. Okay, uh, I actually personally do not join 
National Association of Real Estate Brokers simply because NAR has an organization already enough for that. Uh, so it's just a secondary association. And then, of course, there is, like it says, the last one is there are people that actually are not affiliated with NAR. Uh, I would say probably 70 to 80 percent of all real estate professionals are a member of NAR. 70 to 80, okay? The remainder, approximately maybe 10 to 20 percent, are actually not NAR um, at all. They're not joined with NAR. Uh, they're not affiliated. They are just real estate licensees. Now, let me explain why people, everybody's probably thinking, well, I'm not going to join NAR. That's more cost. I don't want that. I just want my license. Let me explain why you have to join uh, NAR. If you want to be able to go over, and if me and Travis work for two different companies, you, let's say you work for Remax and I work for Keller Williams, okay? In that particular situation, what happens is you end up, if we are part of NAR, I can put my listings in the MLS, you can put yours in the MLS, and both of us can show each other's properties, okay? So in that particular situation, me and you both can show, as long as we're part of NAR now, and we're part of the MLS, we can show. But if you go over and you say, you know what, Justin, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm stepping out of here. I don't want to be part of the NAR. I'm going to be independent, and I'm just going to be, you know, Travis Stahl Realty, okay? So at that point, you release all of this. You no longer have access to our listings. So at that point, if you want to come and show my property, what happens? You now have to end up, you have to do a broker to broker agreement. And let me ask you, do you think I want to have to do a bunch more paperwork with already the paperwork I got to do? No. Now, can I block you from showing my listing? No, I cannot. Okay, because I have a duty to who? Sell it. So I have to get their house sold, and if you call and want to show it, I can't tell you no, because I'm not doing my duty to my client. Okay. However, could I charge my client more because I have to deal with you? Yeah. Yes, I could. Okay. I could go in and I could charge you more and say, you know what, Travis is going to be such a pain, Stefan, because he's not part of the MLS. No, it's just such a big old mess. He ain't going to have none of the data. I'm going to have to do all the work. So, uh, Stefan, I'm going to charge you an extra 1%. Now, do you want me to show to Travis? No. No, at that point, you probably would give me direction to tell Travis what. Well, one one percent could be a lot of money. That's right. Oh, yeah. So do you so do you want me to still show to Travis? No. Okay, no. So you want me to tell Travis, nope, we're not interested anymore. Okay. So again, you have to watch on these situations. Is it cheap to be part of these places? No. When you first when you finish my classes and you get your license. You will have to uh, you will have to actually join NAR, TAR, and your local MLS. You have to if you're going to work. It is approximately if you joined January one, it is approximately fifteen hundred dollars. Okay, now that's for a year, not every month. It's a year you have to pay up front. Now, what I will tell you though, fifteen hundred dollars may seem like a lot. However, Mr. Grossman and Mr. Travis, both of you, y'all been in this business for within a roughly about approximately a year, full time active. Um, in that situation, my question for y'all, in your first sale, did you not make back every penny you spent on your real estate? And then so on. Exactly. I, I made back every penny I spent on joining the associations, paying for the education and the courses, taking the tests on. And that was just from one sale. Yep. So in one sale, while I may be telling y'all fifteen hundred dollars, and a lot of you may be saying, "Oh my God, that's a ton of money." It was a lot when I started. In the beginning, it is a lot, but you make one sale, and guess what? You're you you've already made a profit in one sale. And most real estate new agents make on average two to three sales their first year. So truthfully, your first sale normally will break even. And you make two more, which is profit. And if you budget your money right, and you do it right, it'll keep you going from here on out. But you got to budget your money, okay? Now, 
Characteristics of real estate. Well, what are some characteristics? Well, they're economic. Okay. Again, we don't have a lot of land. If we did, if land was as, as viable as water is, everybody could have it, right? But the problem is there's not much. It's very scarce. Okay. Uh, we don't have uh, enough for everybody. And the problem is, is that all of this land that we have, there's no lit, there's not a cap, if you see what I'm saying. So the government doesn't come in and say, uh uh, no, no, Mr. Stahl, you cannot have more than one acre, Mr. Stahl. Don't you do that. They can't do that. Okay. And let me say this imagine, Mr. Grossman, that I'm the government and I walk in and you're down through your years, your parents have given you, inherited, 200 acres of land. How would you feel? If I, the government, walk in and say, now, Mr. Grossman, give me all of that back except one acre so I can go give to Travis. No, I don't think anyone I'm all for it. it. Yeah, he's for it. What are you for it? No. No. I have a lot of money. Yeah. So in that situation is, is that there is no balance, per se. Okay? So it's it has value. That's what gives it its value because there's very little left. Another thing is... Can you improve land? Yeah, of course. If it's if, like I'm looking outside this window here, it's just a bunch of trees. Okay. Well, could I go in there and tear all that down and put a building there? Yeah. And I can start making money. Okay. So you can improve it. Is it permanent? Can you destroy land? No. No, you cannot destroy land. Some people, some students every semester will say, yeah, I can. I can destroy it. I go out there, I'll catch it on fire, put gasoline on it, I'll burn it. Well, the thing is, eventually, if it burns, it's just going to, it's just going to sit there. The, 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 like you said, the dirt's going to kill out the fire, and that's it. That's right. So in that situation, is it's not going to end up. It does not disappear. Now, could the building be destroyed? Yes. But does the land? That's what we're talking about. Does the land actually get destroyed? No, it doesn't. That, that is a good instance when my brother bought his property. Mm -hmm. He bought, you know, 8,000 square feet of land, basically, with a house on it in the, in the Heights in Houston. And we got a really good deal on it. <clears throat> and I did the math and realized that the, the price we bought it for was actually less than what just the land itself was worth yep. in that area. Yep. And so he was worried about spending this money. And he had, I mean, we, he was all for it, but he kind of had this buyer's remorse sort of thing. And I was just saying, like, I want you to know if tomorrow a hurricane comes through and that house falls over, it, you can resell that property for more than you bought it for. Because yeah. that land ain't going anywhere. So that's right. That land's going to be worth a lot of money. It's, all, it's in the heights. It's, gonna be, it's always going to be worth a lot of money. So Exactly. That's the key thing is, is that in that situation, it is always going to be there. And value of land, because every day, more and more people. I, let me give you a, a hypothetical. Tomorrow in our meeting, we're going to be talking about this. Because of COVID and everything, a lot of people are doing what? They're buying up land, which means people are holding their investments. Well, over the past 10 years that I have been in real estate, 10 years, a little over 10 years, one on 11, actually probably 12 right now, every January we have always had between 500 to about 600 new listings in January every single year. Okay? the past 10 years. Today in my meeting, we only had, in January, the last, last month, there was only 159 new listings taken. So while that right there should show you that people are what? They're, they're buying it and holding. And if they're holding, what's that tell you? It means that economic characteristic means it's going to go up because there's less for sale. Okay, so your investment will go up over time. Area preference, kind of like with Travis, you just said about your brother. He's in an area that is highly wanted. Okay, so his value is going to be more than if you're in, say, 20th Street of Bryan. Yeah. Okay. You're not going to end up, it's going to be completely two different things. His house on his land, he 
year would be worth maybe a quarter or a third of what you got for it. Exactly. And he got a good deal. Exactly. <laughs> and that's because of earnings. You know, and like I tell people this all the time, would you rather have a house next to Kyle Field here at College Station, right next door, or would you rather have a place in Miami Beach? Well, here's the answer. It depends. Because if you're a football fan, where do you want to be? Right next to Kyle Field. But if you are not a football fan and you're a beach person, you want to be in Miami. So area preference is very big as well. The physical characteristics. Of course, we understand. What's the makeup of it? What's the land look like? What's the location? What's all involved in it? One thing that we know is, is it cannot be moved. I mean, uh, uh, Stephen cannot go out there right now and say, you know what? I want to take my, my land, my, the office home with me tonight. Let me, let me fold up the building and put it in my backpack and I'm going to carry it home with me tonight. Is that, is that how this works, Stephen? You can't do that? Yeah, it's immobile. You can't be moved. You don't have to worry about somebody breaking in the window and driving off with your house. Okay? It's not going anywhere. All right? It's also indestructible. We're talking about the land, not the building. The land is indestructible. You cannot destroy it. No two pieces are the same. No two pieces. I can buy a lot right next to you, Travis, right next door, and I could have completely different soil than what you have. Okay? It's different. That was a, can you go back real quick? Yep. That, I got asked that twice, both times I took the test. You got asked twice. I got asked twice on each test. And so I answered that question four times. Oh, yeah, on the one. physical characteristics of land and mobility. Uh, and just mobility. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I got asked that twice. It was on the national portion. Yep. So there's a tip for y'all. That's a tip for all of you listening at home. This most likely will be on your test. Okay. And the reason why is because guess what? Does your clients think like this? No, your clients ain't thinking this. Oh, well, Travis, I want to buy a house because it's immobile and it can't be destroyed and they're not the same. That's why I want to buy it. No, they ain't thinking that. They're thinking school district. They're thinking other things, size, location, bedroom size. They're not worried about these things, but that's your job as an ed or to educate them. Okay. Some other things that affect the land use. Well, Depending on where you're at, it's going to be kind of difficult to build certain types of structures if you're in an area that has bad soil. Or not just soil, but also if you're in an area, say that I want to build a skyscraper in a very high windy location. It's going to be a problem. Okay. What about the transportation? Is that a big thing, Mr. Grossman? Is transportation a big thing? Yeah. Why is that a big thing? Get somewhere. Well, here's the thing. If Mr. Travis, we'll pick on you for a minute. Mr. Travis, say that I move you to, um, let's see here, I'm going to put you in Iola, Texas. And you are 80 years old, you're in a, in a wheelchair, and you're single, and you don't have nobody around. How, uh, so sad. What's, how, how, uh, how, how long are you going to probably survive out there? No long. Can't get nowhere. Can't get nowhere. Because is there any transportation out there for people that are older? No. That's why you'll see a lot of people that are older, they don't live out in the country. They live in the city. Reason why? Transportation. Okay. Public improvements and utilities. This is big. Especially in public transportation and transportation. Oh, yeah. Because of the school. The school and, and, everything like that. and think about Houston. Oh, yeah. Downtown Houston. I'm just thinking like on... Or Bryan College Station, the MLS site, every single piece of property has it. It's on the bus route for College mm -hmm. Station, and if it's not, how many blocks away it is? Yep. Every yep. single, every single one. <laughs> yep. Because transportation is huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, because a lot of college kids, I'll be honest with you, a lot of parents that send their kids to college, they use so much money to send them here, they can't afford a car. Yeah. So what happens is is they get them as close as they can, and then they say, you just going to ride the bus. And if that means you got to get up early in the morning, you're getting up early in the morning. Okay? So, transportation is very key. 
Public improvements and utilities. Of course, utilities are very big. We learned that this past week. Okay, very big. We actually saw Stefan show me today. What did you show me this uh, today, Stefan, on the MLS? What did they say in private remarks? Home is what? Yeah, home did not go out during uh, during the storm. Power did not go out during the storm. Located on what? A hospital. hospital grid. Yeah, located. Home is located on a hospital energy grid. Why is that so important? Power never goes out. So you know, 20 years from now, if the power goes out like that. That's right. Power goes out. You're good. Because you know you're with the hospital. My mom's house in Galveston, they're on the UTMB power grid. And so she never had them. Yeah, they never lost power. Yep. Because of the fact of the matter is, is that utilities are big. You lose, you lose power. That's a big thing. I went out this week. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt. Now, how do you find out about houses being on certain grids? Is that listed in the MLS? Well, no. <laughs> it's actually okay. how they found out was basically after this past storm, the city, like people would tell everybody if their power stayed on. So now when they want to sell their house, those clients will tell their agents and their agents will then put it on there. So uh -huh. that's how my mom, we're my, finding my, out. Yeah, my mom learned it because her whole block didn't go out, but they're also two blocks away from UT. Like they're right next to the hospital and their whole section of land didn't go out. But down the road a little bit, all those, all their power went out and everything. So they just kind of figured out which that, ones are yeah, which. I don't even think you can find out. Like yeah, you won't you won't be able to know which grid, but you can find out just like what happened. Yeah. You'll find out just because of where you were located. You know, and it was it was kind of funny to be honest, Miss Lima. So I live about two three minutes from my office, and uh, the house was always out. But the office, I was able to check my cameras and all, no problem. I'd say I'm two and two to three minutes the other direction. Yeah, and we had rolling power. We had power the whole time. It would go off at certain points and come back on, but so yeah, so only power. But we never lost nice. power fully. So, so I, that shows right there. We're five minutes away from you. Yep. <laughs> so it shows just right there where that line is, just where it comes through. But yeah, I mean, it's a big thing. And those are things as a real estate agent that you want to know. See, most, see, prior to what happened, how many of us in here at all thought? That, oh, I need to be asking my clients, are they on this uh, on a hospital grid? No, nobody thought that. Never did I. All right. I thought when it was coming in, I said, oh, it's no big deal. It's just like everything else. I, I'm ready for this. Until hmm. the night that it happened <laughs> and I lost everything. Night. Yeah, it's all gone. So in that particular situation, understand that you, you will see as you go through in real estate, you'll learn things. And you'll learn a lot of different things. Just like Miss Leela coming to your to your question that we were talking about. There are certain things, Miss Leela, I bet you know about Houston that nobody else may know in this classroom. It's just it's those things, just like Travis, you and Galveston. Yeah. There are certain things that you know because it's home. And so for you to be able to sell the property, you gotta think about those little things so that you can entice other people. What was the benefits about where you lived at? You know, those are little things like that. If you actually stopped and thought and wrote a list of every little benefit about where you lived at, that gives you that basically or selling characteristic that will help you improve your sale of that property. Okay. Again, natural resources, very key. One thing that I learned when all the power was going out, I was so thankful that we actually had a gas water heater. I'm just going to be real honest with you. We did not have power, but we had gas water heater and we had a gas stove. So with that situation, win-win. You see what I'm saying? Uh, but again, natural resources, what's available, what's around. In regards to the importance of value in the real estate business, of course, value is the fundamental focus of all aspects of the real estate business. Uh, the value, of course, is defined basically as the amount of goods or services that are considered to be fair and suitable that are going to be equivalent for something else. The amount of goods or services that will be offered in the marketplace as well as exchange for any given product. 
the present worth of future benefits arising out of that ownership. You have your objective and subjective value. The value of real property does not remain constant and the value is going to be different from the price and the cost. Now, what does all of that mean? What exactly does all of that hoopla mean that I just talked about? Well, let's just put it easy for you. I'm just going to make it real easy for you. All of this basically means this. Number one, Travis, do you think, give me, give me a hobby that you like to do. Uh, disc golf, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Disc golf. To you, that's something that you enjoy. Yeah. You have fun. So if, um, say Mr. Jacob said, hey, I'll trade you one uh, for a Coke. I'll trade you, uh, you know, a disc. Yeah. You might do it, wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Because to you, hey, that's got value. Yeah. But if he comes to me and says, hey, Justin, I'll, here's, give me, I'll give you a disc for a Dr. Pepper. I'm like, I don't want that. What, what do you want me to do with that? I, I don't know what to do. So the key thing in this situation is, is that you have to understand, it's very important that what they're trying to, to convey here is that the value is different. Value is different between me and you, Travis. There are certain things that you may enjoy that I may not, and things that I enjoy, you may not. So what they're talking about is, like me, I love to be on a beach. Put me on a beach, put me in Miami, we good. We here, we're gold. But I have friends, they hate water. They don't want to be around water. They hate it. They don't want to be on no beach. They'd rather be in the mountains. That's where they, they'd rather be skiing. You put me in a ski a suit and try to eat, no. I could probably break my, my neck and, uh, and probably be, what's that, Sonny Bono that killed himself and hit the tree? That would be me, okay? Just going to be honest with you. So the key thing here is that everything has different value, okay? So in these particular situations, like I try to tell everybody is, is that you have to understand that the value that I give or that I may have is not always going to be the same. Same goes with real estate. Justin? Yes, ma'am? Do people even know who Sonny Bono is? Probably not. Probably <laughs> not. Other than Miss Davenport, myself, you, Mr. Jacob maybe knows, and that's probably it. That's probably Thought all. about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's probably all that knows who I'm talking about. If you know Cher, that was her husband, just FYI. But, uh, I, you know, I, just thinking about that, they probably not many knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, I just, I just want to point that out. <laughs> I, I appreciate that, Ms. Leela. I appreciate that. Because it is, I mean, it, it's just, you end up in these situations. I mean, everybody has different, different views. I mean, I can tell you for a fact that myself, um, you know, it's, I've had a client before. I actually had this happen. I was showing a property and this guy was in awe when we went and showed it. This guy had a, the seller had an old timey lawnmower. The ones that you sit on top, got the metal bench and you just bounce along as you're riding. Okay. And uh, he, this, the client I was showing was like, oh my God, I love that. You know, that's awesome. You know, wonderful. And uh, so he ended up, they were talking back and forth and uh the guy was like, yeah, yeah, I got this. And so my client, buyer, said, I have one too, but I'm trying to get rid of it. He said, I'm trying to get rid of it. Well, this seller likes those things. He collected them. That's what he did. He enjoyed John Deere and all that stuff. So my client said, instead of me putting up cash, I need my cash. I will give you as earnest my lawnmower. That old timey 19, probably 60s or 50s lawnmower. And that's what they agreed to. And what I'm trying to get to this point is, is that money does not always have to be transferred. See, 90% of the time, Travis, what do we do? Paper, money, right? Get checks, put the check, that's what happens. But there is that time that money is actually going to end up, is not always going to be necessary. Because see, here's the thing. Travis, if you end up having millions in the bank and I have millions in the bank, you may not want more money because you already got enough, but you may say, you know what, man, I like that ring you got on your hand. You put that up because it's a rare thing. 
So in that situation, that's one thing that I've seen over my time, is just as I've, as I've aged, is I've seen that people, money's not a big thing to people. As you get older, you get money, but you don't have stuff. And so a lot of times, like one of my good buddies, he don't want new cars. He's like, there, it's a new car, I don't give a crap. He would prefer like what you had, an old Ford Mustang. Yeah. That's what he would prefer. And because of the fact of the matter is, is there's not many left. You know, a new car, everybody has it. That's what he always says. I'm not going to buy a Mustang because everybody in their mom, dad, aunt, and uncle has a Mustang. But a 1960s model, they don't all have those. They're very far few in between. Okay. So again, it comes back to that's what we're getting here is worth. Okay. The value of things is going to be different. Okay. Now, what about supply and demand? Well, we all know what supply and demand is. Okay, there's a lot of supply. Is there going to be a lot of demand? No. Like I tell people all the time, I don't have a bottle with me. I always normally have a bottle of water. Stephen has his little water deal here, but so Mr. Travis, right now, yeah. or actually Miss Leela, I'm gonna pick on you for a minute, Miss Leela. Miss Leela. So this bottle of water, this bottle of water right here. Okay. My question to you: How much is this worth to you right now? For me to purchase? Yeah, well, it, yeah, okay. That's what we'll say. How of much, value. Yeah, how much would you value this right now, right this minute? What would you say it's worth to you? Two pennies. How much? Two pennies. Two pennies. Okay, <laughs> two pennies. Now, Miss Lee, I'm going to ask you this question. Imagine mm. Travis just took all the water out of the world. There's no more water except this bottle. It's all mine now. Now, how much is the um, I think I would I would probably beat up Travis and oh, figure out oh, where his supply is. <laughs> See, there you go. There you go, right there. The thing is now, it would be incredibly valuable because it'd be the only bottle left. That's right. And that's what we come back here with supply and demand. Is it's the thing that we're seeing. I guarantee you, I know back when my grandfather and grandmother, land wasn't that expensive. Land was not that expensive. You could buy an acre for four or five thousand dollars. Okay, our neighbor next door. Okay, you gotta understand when I used to live in Navasota, the guy that lived next door to us, he bought his property, his land, and his house for twenty-eight thousand dollars. Twenty-eight thousand dollars. He bought his land and his house right next door. When he passed away, that land and that house was worth $275,000. The thing is, is that shows you over time, the supply of land is what? Going down, but the demand is doing what? Going up, okay? Because of the fact of the matter is, we are multiplying, we're multiplying. People are having more kids. And what they're saying is because of this COVID situation, more people are at home. And if more people are at home, what are they doing? Having babies, okay? Which is more kids. They're saying the baby boomer era is now happening because of COVID. We're having another baby booming era because of this. So what happens? You're gonna have more children, which creates more demand, which means you gotta get that land and the more people that buy it, and there's not many people willing to sell, well, you got more demand, not enough supply. Guess what? There's an issue. The value will go through the roof. Okay. Now, what is the difference between value versus price versus cost? Well, value, of course, is what you put on it. Okay. Price is approximately what you'll pay. The cost is what exactly it is. So what I mean by this is this. You may value your property, Travis, at $300,000. That's what you value. The value and the price, however, are not always the same. You may value it, and, and I'll give a real life hypothetical. My grandmother, as some of you have already know, my grandmother passed away on Wednesday of last week. And, you know, to my aunt, that house is worth what? Tons of money. It's, it's, there is no value. It's so, it's so priceless. Okay. But Miss Leela, are you going to pay 
uh, an unlimited amount of money for a two bedroom house in Hempstead, Texas, just because my aunt thinks it's worth a ton of money? No. More than likely, no. Uh, not at all. Because what somebody else values, they would have to have the same value, yeah. the same character. So like she said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. She'll pay a fair price. She'll pay a fair price. She'll pay what it actually is. But the cost is different because the cost is how much, and I'll put it in this situation, the cost, if you want to put it this way, let's go from cost to value. Cost is this. If you go and you buy land and you build on it, say that Travis, you bought some land here in College Station and you spent $20,000, okay? And then you spent another 80,000 to build your house, okay? How much did it cost you? A hundred thousand, a hundred thousand. You end up, you lived in it with your wife, y'all have kids, your children grew up in the property and you raise them all in that property and you have 30 years of memories in that property. How much is that thing valued at to you? Oh, a lot. Oh. Okay. Do you think Stefan is going to give you what you think your value is? What's he going to give you? The fair market <laughs> price. Yeah. He's going to give you what everything else in that area is there. Value is your personal feelings. Okay. It's just like when I left my old office and went here. Yeah, I, I didn't like the location or any of that, but I had a lot of memories at it. But does anybody care about that? No. So there's your differences. Value is what you put on it yourself, but that's you including everything. Price is actually what it's worth. Cost is what it cost you to actually go get them. Okay. Now, of course, the market, we talked about the market in regards to how it can go up and down. Supply and demand, y'all understand that concept. Again, as supply goes up, prices go down, just like we talked about the water situation. If everybody can go buy water, so what? That's why bottled water is dirt cheap. Okay. But over last week, how much was water worth to people? I didn't care, they pay whatever, okay? Some people get in fights, like Miss Leela was saying. She, she gonna get her water from you, Travis, by the way. <laughs> and demand, as it goes up, guess what? Prices go up, okay? What are some factors that affect supply? Well, labor force. I remember when I was younger. I don't know, Miss Leela, you might remember this too. Do you remember, um, Oh my goodness, there was in Hempstead, uh, Lawrence Marshalls, the, the dealership. Do you remember that, Miss Leela? Yes, I do. Uh-huh. Lawrence Marshall used to be one of the largest dealerships in the state, one of the largest ones. And in that situation was, it was literally the driving force for Hempstead. I remember people from miles around would go to Lawrence Marshall mm -hmm. to get the best deal possible. Okay. But when Lawrence Marshall went out of business, the entire economic foundation for Hempstead went down the chute. Okay. Because of the fact of the matter is there was no longer the need for those jobs. Those jobs disappeared. Like I tell people this all the time. Imagine if Texas A&M today just miraculously went bankrupt and Blinn College went bankrupt. Think of, the, think of how College Station would be today. Will we be where we're at, Stephan? Do you think that this town would be as busy as it is and growing as much as it is if Texas A&M and Blinn College went bankrupt today? No. You'd see an entire shift in the, the entire, basically, economic balance of the cities, okay? So you have to always understand that labor force has a huge impact on supply. Construction costs, this, we're dealing with this right now. I'm having board meetings almost every other week, it seems like, because we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do. But over COVID in 2020, we're feeling the effects of 2020 in 2021. Because everybody was off and they weren't able to build and, and, and make lumber and all, 
Well, because lumber is so much scarce, construction costs have tripled. We were talking in one meeting and they were talking about, you know, I built this house and I ended up in this particular house. I used to build it for about 100, 100 to 120,000. Now it's cost me close to $200,000. So I'm having to, if not double, triple my home prices so I can still make my profit that I've been wanting. Okay. Construction plays a huge play. Governmental controls. The government can always screw stuff up. Doesn't matter what political view you are, government can screw crap up for you. It's as simple as that. Doesn't matter what your political affiliation, the government can screw it up for you. Okay? Just like what we talked about with the, the two, no more than two unrelated individuals. If you have homes that are investment homes at College Station, and they passed this resolution tonight. Guess what? You're gonna see a lot of people list those homes and do what? Buy elsewhere, okay? Governmental financial policies. This is another part that can have a huge play. The government ends up, spends a lot of money and devalues the dollar, what happens? Things have to go up, okay? What about demand? Well, we talked earlier about population, okay? In regards to population, what ends up happening here? You have a bunch of kids, and guess what? Those kids need what? Those kids turn around and they need places to stay, okay? So, of course, over time, you're going to grow. The demographics, as well as employment levels and wage levels, also plays a huge role, a very huge role. Now, of course, we all understand business cycles. Expansion means what? Growth. Recession means slowdown and depression means the bottom. And of course we have revival, which is your recovery. Okay. But understand in these particular situations, every single one of these has a huge play, a huge impact. Okay. The all, every one of these has some form of a, basically an effect on the cycle. Okay. Of course, we try to stay as much as we can in the expansion phase. We have to understand that we unfortunately do not control everything. A lot of people will say we're headed to a depression because what's going on? Well, with millions and millions of people out of work, guess what? People aren't buying. And if those people aren't buying, things slow down. And as things slow down, you eventually get to a point where you're in a depression. You imagine today if China called in all of their debts from the United States today, you think we'd be ready to make it? No. Okay. So you have to understand that there are going to be different cycles that are part of it. Okay. All right. That basically are lucky tonight. That basically covers our slides for this evening. Okay. So we're going to have a pretty short night tonight, and I kind of was hoping that would happen simply because this is our first night back in session, okay? So we are back in session. We will pick up and continue, but again, that is our first lecture for this evening for real estate uh, principles, okay? We will pick up tomorrow and do chapter two and proceed from there. Those of you, uh, well, let's go ahead and let's stop the recording for me.